on this edition of Around BCC. We begin to look ahead towards summer and the many offerings the college has for kids. Our alumni profile is of a woman who takes her love of dental health outside the office. And we look at a number of campus activities to wrap up the academic year. Welcome to Around BCC, I'm Keith Thibault. It's May and that means it's the final month of the 2008-2009 academic year here at Bristol Community College. It's also the last episode of Around BCC for this year. That means our minds are now turning towards summer and hopefully a lot longer, longer uh, warmer weather rather because winter was kind of tough this year. And even though summer is here, there's a lot of activities going on at Bristol Community College. There's a whole list of activities of credit and non-credit courses throughout the entire summer. And we're going to talk about one aspect of what happens here at BCC each year. For over 10 years now, BCC has hosted a kids college where kids of various ages can take part in a number of activities throughout the summer, basically starting right after the 4th of July up until about the middle of August. And to speak about Kids College this year is the Kids College Coordinator, Laurie Quigley. And Laurie, thank you for taking the time to join us today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Now, Kids College, as I mentioned, has been around for a little over uh, 10 years. And um, there's a lot of activities for, for, for students. What's the age, uh, age range rather, of, of students who can take part in Kids College? The classes begin for kindergarten through grade 12. OK. so. Children approximately five years old. Five years old. Up until high school. Yep. Pretty much. High school. And uh, there's a wide range of activities. So we're going to go through all you know many of the classes that are offered. So um, if you you know have a youngster, um, you know it's not too early to think about this because school will be ending uh, for the elementary and high schools soon enough, and you may want to think of of kids college as an alternative for your uh, for your child this summer. Now. Five, um, about age five to about age, let's say 18, that's the high school, high school years, is the uh, age range for students to come to Kids College. What's the turnout been, say, in the past few years? Has been, there been a good turnout? Are some ages, you know, more popular than others in terms of the Kids College, you know, those who attend? Enrollment has been very strong. Um, we do have um, a lot more younger children than we have the older children. Mm -hmm. But um, there's pretty um, there's courses for all ages, so it's been pretty good. I would tend to think that some of the older children, especially those 16, 17, they may have jobs of their own that may take up a lot of their time mm -hmm. this you know during the summer. But there are some opportunities for them as well in that age yes, group. Yes, there are. All right. Let, in terms of um, the time frame, the Classes usually start the week after 4th of July, around that time, which would be, I think, is it the 7th this July year? 7th. I think July 7th. Yep. And it ends, when's the end date? Um, August 16th. August 16th. Mm -hmm. So it's about a six-week? Six-week program. Six-week program. And, um, and it's primarily a Monday through Thursday event. Yes, it there is. There are no classes offered on a Friday. No, there are not. So even though you know, there are plenty of opportunities for these students here at BCC, Got to keep in mind that people who are looking for um, something for their children during the summer, Friday you have to make other arrangements because BCC's Kids College is not offered on yes. a Friday. So that's very important to know. Now in terms of the fee structure, and we'll get into some of the, the more popular programs, mm -hmm. but in terms of the fee, fee structure, what can parents expect to pay per course? Um, per course they can expect to pay $95. Okay. And depending on what course they have and what is necessary to run the course, they go up to um, $110. So it depends on the type of course. Some may need more materials, that yes. type of thing. Yes. So there'd be a little more of, of a charge for those type of courses. Now, basically what happens with Kids College is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, basically they're, as we said, Monday through Thursday. And there's usually two different sessions a day where there, there's a session, say, from 9 to uh, 11, 11, 11, yep. 11, 30. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one from like 11.45 or 12 o'clock to about 2. To quarter 2, yes. To about quarter of mm -hmm. 2. So, so there are basically two sessions a day 
of varying topics. So students are here at BCC, say, from about 9 to about 2 each day. So again, it's not a full day for parents, but it's a good chunk of their day. Is that correct? It is correct. All right. Let's take a look now at, at some of the, um, of the courses. And when the courses are devised, Lori, let me ask you, what, what is the thinking in terms of, is, it, is the thinking of trying to provide students with a well-rounded group of activities some that are academic in nature, some that are more fun, and, and how is that? How is that worked out? It's working out very well because what we're trying to do is we're trying to combine the academics with fun because mm -hmm. learning should be fun, and we don't want it to be like um, not enjoyable for them. We want it to be hands-on. We want it to be involved. Um, the classrooms are very small size, so they get a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention, and um, it's something that they can have fun and also keep up with their educational skills throughout the summer. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that uh, you know students go to go to school from September to June. They don't want more regular book work, I would think, during the summer. So I know, like you said, BCC tries to make it where they're learning something, but it's in a fun yes. and welcoming Relaxed environment. Relaxed environment, yes. Now you said class sizes are small. Um, is there a restriction in, in class size for all all of the the offerings, or it depends on some of the other offerings? You may let more students in than yes. others. Yes. Um, for example, we have like a getting ready for kindergarten which would be children that are five years old that are entering kindergarten in September. Mm -hmm. um, we cut them off at um, 10 to 12 students for the class size. Um, if you've ever worked with five-year-olds, you'd understand exactly why we would do that. Right. Um, with the older kids, with um, the tennis or you know, the other classes that they do offer, um, with the age and the teacher ratio, um, they can actually allow a little bit more children in the courses. All right, let's talk about some of the courses um, some of these some of these courses actually transcend many of the age groups but one of the things we talked about before coming on uh, on the air here is we talked about the introduction to Lego engineering that appears to be it's one of the relatively new offerings here yes. at, at Kids College probably one of the more popular ones I would think yes, just because of the fact mm -hmm. that it's Legos and all kids have Legos mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that program and what, what does it involve? Um, that program actually has two different age groups um, the teachers that work in that um, program are actually trained and each of the children that come into the program get their own Lego kit. They learn to create anything that they're working on for the day from pulleys or um, any other scientific things that they can come up with and they actually can get them to function by following their own directions and then they get to take them apart and create something new mm -hmm. on a different basis. And the levels that they can work on are up to the kids because they have their own books Mm -hmm. with someone that's trained in the Legos to make it, you know, to create it and to help them along with the program. Right. And you've got the intro to Lego engineering for the younger children, kindergarten and first and second grade. Mm -hmm. Then as you go along, you've got Lego engineering one, and then I, would I safe to assume there's a Le Lego engineering two? It's funny because when you go into the Legos classes, you think, oh, Legos, we can handle it. But some of the things are very, very I'm, complicated for them to create. I'm, I'm sure I'd have a tough time with the intro <laughs> class, to be quite honest with you. But uh, again, you've got that that um, that steps where I'm sure the engineering one would be a little more advanced mm -hmm. for those students who may have higher aspirations in terms of engineering. And does it get students thinking about possibly, especially in the higher grades, maybe thinking about engineering as a field going forward? I'm sure if it's something that they enjoy and when they see actually that they can construct something on their own and actually use it in the classroom, I'm sure it's going to open up ideas for them later on to get into a field that they enjoy. Now, some of the other um, some of the other aspects of uh, kids' college, especially for the younger kids, there's a lot of um, hands-on experiences in terms of science um, and and also a lot of crafts. Um, how important is is that for the younger kids maybe to to grasp that that you know. I guess it goes back to what you said earlier about making it fun, making, you know, like hands-on science. You talk about science and, you know, I think of college science, unfortunately, which, you know, can get kind of laborious. But for students, how do you try to make these things fun and learn at the same time? Say, say for science. You know, for our science classes, a lot of them go through um, growing things. So for them to actually take a seed, to plant it, and to watch it grow into something that they can actually take home and mm -hmm. nurture and watch it grow is a great learning process for them. For the older kids, I'm um, creating a volcano and being there and watching their faces when it erupts. Mm -hmm. You know, things like that, watching them actually build something with their hands and seeing how it 
works for them, it, it's very exciting to them. Now, one of the things that we see throughout all the age levels, uh, actually there's a couple, but one of them that, that, that I, I, I see right away is that there's an emphasis on you know, getting kids either more familiar with or maybe introducing in some aspects to computers. You've got some computer math classes, you've got some uh, computer science classes, I believe. There's some reading classes that involve computers. Mm -hmm. For the older kids, you've got things like creating a web page, things of that sort. Um, how, how important is it for the teachers of Kids College to gauge the level of competence in, in some students? Because I would think that you, some of the younger kids may not, have, depending on their financial situation, may not have even been introduced to computers. So, but you may have some of that same class who, you know, have been familiar with computers from the start. Is that a difficult, you What's know? nice about that is, is that in each classroom there is the teacher and they also have an assistant. So when you're working on a project and if you have a couple of children that are very experienced in the topic that you're working on, um, they'll have the opportunity to work on a different project at the same time when mm -hmm. you have someone that's learning the basic skills of a computer. Right. So there's a way to balance that yes. experience and, and, and inexperience. Another of the courses which seems to be popular is the cooking up a storm course where the students actually get their aprons on and do cooking. Um, at what age levels are those? Are those spread out? Or they are spread out. Okay, yep, so you've got some out. younger classes. There are definitely younger classes and all the way through the high school okay. level is popular still. And those uh, are those one of the ones that kind of fills up kind of quickly? They fill you? up quickly and we get phone calls till the day before with a waiting list asking if their child can be part of the program. Oh, so that's good. So even though classes are filled, mm -hmm. you also compile a waiting list in case someone we happens try to, to drop out. Yeah, we and, try. And it's obviously first come, first serve on the waiting list? Yes, first come, first so serve. So if you're on a waiting list for any of these classes, it's first come, first serve mm -hmm. if someone happens to, to drop out. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other maybe more popular uh, kids' college offerings? Um, there's a new intro to sports, which was really big with the middle schoolers. Um, they learned um, basketball skills, and we've also had intro to soccer in there, um, tennis skills. A lot of the children that do these sports actually do participate in team sports. Mm -hmm. So they're getting um, extra practice over the summer before they go back to school in the fall, mm -hmm. which is very nice. Um, there are a, a, a number of offerings. I also noticed that there is there some uh, martial arts as well? There is martial arts, yes. Okay. I would think that would be popular. For it's some very, very popular. It's always full, yes. Now, getting into some of the older, the older uh, categories, you've got the cooking up a storm. You've got the uh, obviously the, the the crafts and and um, and and the like. Basketball, you had mentioned. Um, is there anything that um, a lot of the older students may be interested in? Um, I know that you've got things like photography and um, even some some theater type yes. courses as well. Mm -hmm. Is that would that be maybe more where the older students may, may be interested more than the younger kids? Definitely, yeah. The, um, the older kids, their very popular course also too is an SAT prep. Oh, okay, good. Um, that's usually full for both sessions for the older kids. Um, the older kids also love the acting class. Um, they still like their cooking and their sports. So they find a balance. They can do one educational and one fun. Mm -hmm. And um, just to wrap up here, as we're, we're, we're running out of time, students can, uh, families, parents can register their students right now. Registration yep. is now open, mm -hmm. and classes start on July 7th and end on August 18th, so it's a six-week program. If you have any questions about Kids College, just give the college a call. The main number here in Fall River is 508-678-2811, and just ask for information on Kids College, and you'll be forwarded to... Uh, to that individual. And something that's also important is Kids College is also offered in Attleboro. Yes, it is. Is that correct? New Bedford? Not New Bedford? No. Okay, so Fall River and Attleboro, yes. there are Kids College offerings available. Mm -hmm. Laurie, thank you for taking the time to talk about Kids College. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Right now, we have our final installment of our what has become a very popular segment here on Around BCC. It's the alumni in your community. <laughs> I'm Thelma Des and I graduated from BCC in 1997 in the dental hygiene program. I have to thank my twin sister, 
for actually getting into the program, or even studied in the dental field. We were both working in factories, and she said to me one day, you know, we're not getting any younger, we were not teens, we're not getting any younger, we really need to do something that will make us better people, be able to support ourselves better. And when she brought me to Diamond for a um, postgraduate program that they had there, and I applied, and I took the placement test, the placement test and was admitted into the program. That was a turning point in my life. I became a dental hygienist because I was inspired by a good friend of mine, Diane. She had started the program over at BCC and told me how wonderful it was and I wanted to be part of that team. So I started applying. When I finally received my letter in 1995, saying that I was accepted into the program. I was so happy and I couldn't wait to show them that I would have the knowledge base already from the prerequisites that I had taken toward the program to actually fulfill what I needed to do in the actual program. The uh, instructors were wonderful. I was truly inspired by one particular instructor, Mrs. Clancy. As it turns out, I've been working for the same dentist for 20 years over 20 years now, and we're, we happen to be married now, but at the, when I first started uh, working for him, we were not married, and it just, it's one of those things you don't know that true love is looming, and then you fall in love, and we've been together ever since. I love the versatility of the time frame. I can actually choose my hours. I am unmarried and have two children, so I can actually choose the days and the hours that I want which I didn't have that flexibility as an assistant. And I, I feel I have more control over the actual patient care, whereas I didn't feel that with assisting. February is Dental Health Month, Children's Dental Health Month, and every February I pick and choose all of the um, schools and libraries that we have around here, and I ask if I can do presentations there. I have some that I've been doing them since I started in 12 years ago, but I have others that I've incorporated I actually just started one in Lincoln, New Hampshire, over at the library there. What they entail is I actually go in and I put on a presentation for children. I go into the schools and I have a, a little model of a doll. It's a Franny Flossosaurus and she has teeth. And I actually show and demonstrate to the children the proper way to brush and floss their teeth. And I also have a book that I will read to them and showing them more of uh, techniques and ways to keep the teeth healthy and clean. And I have a video at the end to show them to reinforce it. I'm a huge advocate on children's dental health. I feel that if we start them off young, that then they will have these techniques to continue on throughout their lifetime. And I, at the end, I have a little goodie bag that I give all the children and I put all of my presentations together myself. I supply all of my supplies myself and I do not accept any compensations for it. I really enjoy doing the presentations because of the reactions I get from the students. The, the, um, the ages that I um, do my presentations are from first graders to second graders, so you're looking at about six to seven year olds, and they have the mixed dentition, which is their teeth, are they're starting to lose teeth, they have baby teeth, and they have adult teeth at the same time. So the, uh, it's interesting when I ask them who has been to the dentist and when I get a show of hands and I have 90% of the students have been to the dentist, it's overwhelming because I love to see that. But it's, there's always a few that you see have never been to the dentist and they, they're afraid to go to the dentist and that's where I want to go out there and really apply and all my knowledge I know toward the community so they know how important it is for the children to start on their dental health at such a young age. As a private clinician working in a dental field, I use my knowledge that I have occurred from BCC and the skills that I have learned from BCC, and I use, tie those all together every single day when I work with my patients. And I feel that without BCC, I never would have had that knowledge base. And they have been the whole basis of all of my dental career. And I really thank BCC for that, and I thank Mrs. Clancy. <laughs> Elsewhere around BCC, the end of the academic year can mean only one thing. Commencement is right around the corner. This year's ceremony will take place on Saturday, May 30th, beginning at 11 a.m. at the Fall River campus. Those of you watching in Fall River can view the commencement exercisers live 
on Comcast Cable Channel 95. Many of the BCC graduates will begin the difficult task of trying to find employment. Those in the human services field had a chance to see what job opportunities await them at a job fair held last month. Human Services Program Coordinator Kevin Garganta says the recessionary economy provides students with challenges as well as prospects. The fact that the economy is not strong right now is really a double-edged sword because the services are very often needed more than ever, but things like social services and education sometimes are the first thing to be hit by budget cuts. So this fair is actually, unfortunately, the smallest one that we've had in 11 years as far as agencies participating because of the economy. Some of the ones that have come year after year after year called me up and said, Kevin, I'm sorry, we just can't come this year because we're experiencing layoffs and budget cuts and things like that. So it's, the times are tough. The times are tough. Student Lori Lowney says she's interested in working with the elderly or adolescents who are often overlooked in times of need. She says the Opportunity Fair is a great resource. Well, in today's economy, uh, the job market is so scarce as we know, of course. Um, and Kevin has brought in quite a few agencies right now um, that I didn't know were even out there. I am looking for an internship in um, the domestic violence field, um, which I'm quite passionate about. And there were quite a few agencies here today that I didn't even know existed. In terms of future employment opportunities, the need to become a more sustainable society through conservation and alternative energy resources provides plenty of possibilities. BCC has been in the forefront of the sustainability effort for some time and recently hosted a conference on how our reliance on oil can potentially become a health concern. Professor Nancy Lee Wood, director of the college's Institute of Post-Carbon Education, says the medical field relies heavily on the use of petroleum-based products. So much of our healthcare system depends upon oil. Virtually everything within the healthcare system depends upon it. It's not only the transport of ambulances and emergency vehicles, but uh, a lot of the equipment, all of the equipment is dependent upon fossil fuels. Uh, not just oil, but also coal and uh, natural gas to some extent. Also, um, a lot of the um, when you think of all of the equipment that's in offices, you go to a doctor's office, you go to a hospital, plastic, plastic is everywhere, and plastic is based on what? Petroleum. Uh, you look at gels, you look at x-rays, you look at all kinds of procedures. They're all dependent upon oil. So we have a medical system that is absolutely just about 100% dependent upon fossil fuels, and particularly oil, that are now starting to peak and go into decline early in this century. Wood also says that the medical community is not ready to make changes. The public health community has been very late coming to the table on this subject. Of course, we as a society has been very late coming to the table on this subject, so it's not just the public health sector. But when you consider how important the public health services are to various communities, uh, it's really critical that this discussion be started. And so many, many, many people around the country who work in the public health field, you know, they probably know something about oil and, you know, that we're entering some kind of a fossil fuel dilemma and so forth. But people really don't understand the full implications. This fall, the Institute will be launching a new certificate program which will focus on producing a more locally controlled food resource. We've become very used to having fruits and vegetables and meats and so forth come from very long distances. California, Mexico, Argentina, France, Japan, etc., etc. This is not a sustainable food system and we cannot continue in this way. So once I began to really understand about three years ago how, what a critical situation we were in regarding fossil fuel and food, I thought the most important thing we can do is get some kind of agriculture program going here at the college where people could come, learn how to do organic, localized growing, and start learning the kinds of things that we're going to need to have done for us in the future. Those interested in the Organic Agriculture Technology Program should contact the college for more information. 
The college's Luzo Centro has unveiled a new element to its educational portfolio. The Dabney Collection is a series of letters, books, diaries, and illustrations of the Dabney and Hickling families, two American families who did more than any other for the people of the Azores in the 19th century. Dabney descendant and professor emeritus of English, Arthur Lothrop, says his family is looked at with favor in the history of the Azores. From 1808, basically, until 1892, they were United States consuls in the island of Fayal in the Azores. And they were beloved of the people there, the Azorean people, because they, they did so much to, uh, as good neighbors and as business associates. Um, and they, they, they always had a great respect for the Azorean people. If you read through the Annals of the Dabney family, which is a three volume compendium of all their letters and, and diaries, and et cetera, uh, you won't find evidence of prejudice. It's pretty remarkable in a time when other things written about almost any people foreign to the United States, uh, you, you, you show this kind of prejudice, but you don't see anything like that in the Dabneys. Lothrop says most of the material he accumulated was stored in his attic, while others have been donated by other members of the Dabney family. He says he hopes the collection can be used by students studying Luso-American history. I also hope that uh, there may be students interested in, in the actual day-to-day uh, -day work of the, of the uh, collection. In other words, somebody who might want to transcribe some of the letters. It's a kind of activity that you, 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 I think it has a special uh, appeal to some people. And, and if there are any people like that who'd like to, to read letters and type them out for us, that would be a service to the, uh, to the uh, collection. And there may be some way we can get some academic credit for that. We haven't, we haven't looked into that yet. That's it for this edition and this season of Around BCC. We leave you today with a look at the annual student juried art exhibit currently on view at the Grimshaw Goodowitz Art Gallery at the Fall River Campus. I'm Keith Tebow. Thanks for watching and have a great summer. Thank you.